one could argue convincingly that pathological narcissism is sometimes the outcome of peer rejection within peer groups. This is very common with autistic children, children on the autism spectrum disorder, who are usually shunned, excommunicated, mocked, ridiculed, or avoided by their peers. And this creates in them narcissistic defenses. And if they are also rejected by other reference group, such as, for example, parental figures, teachers, <clears throat> role models, these children might end up being narcissist as well as autistic. So peer groups play a major role in the formation of pathological narcissism, especially in childhood and even more so in adolescence. And this is the topic of today's video. My name is Sam Vaknin and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, a former visiting professor of psychology and currently a professor of clinical psychology and business management in SIAPS, Cambridge, United Kingdom. So, peer groups and peer pressure. We've all heard these phrases. But first of all, let me clarify something. Belonging to peer groups, succumbing to peer pressure, conforming to peer norms and expectations, this is not confined only to children or adolescents. According to Eric Erikson and many others, peer interactions continue throughout life and they help to shape our identity and our conduct. Now, peers are not always a primary group. Primary group is a supportive group, a group that affords succor and help and advice. They are not always these, this positive. Peer groups are always a social group, and usually peers share interests and values, something known as homophily, <laughs> not what you think. But sometimes, or even I would say often, Peers are not only your friends, they're also your enemies. To generalize, I would say that peers are frenemies. They're frenemies especially in adolescence, during this period where the, ch the child or the adolescent, the teenager, experiments with a variety of identities, gender roles, and sexual orientations during this experimentation phase the moratorium phase, according to Erikson, peers tend to be antagonistic and dissocial as well as supportive and pro-social. Be that as it may, even when your peers are perceived to be potential enemies, adversaries, foes, bullies, the reason for distress and ego dystony, even with such peers, they are always the point of reference. We always define ourselves in relation to and contradistinction to our peers. And this induces in us twin conditions which are mutually exclusive. In other words, it creates in us a dissonance between ego syntony and ego dystony, which can culminate even in suicidal ideation. Let me explain. This was a mouthful. When you belong to a peer group, when you're surrounded by your peers, and your peers don't have to be physically present. Peers could be virtual, on, online, on the internet. Peers could be your colleagues around the world. Um, peers are a reference group. When you define yourself and comport yourself in relation to your reference group, this could create in you a sense of belonging, acceptance, and affiliation. In other words, can make you feel good, ego syntony, but it can make you feel bad if you feel that you have fallen short, failed someone, frustrated your peers, um, do not conform, do not belong, you're not accepted. In short, you're not uh, receiving love. Um, from the group. 
in this case there is egodystony and usually both situations are simultaneous at the same time you are on good terms with some of your peers and on bad terms with others and this creates simultaneous egosyntony a feeling of warm fuzzy glow and egodystony a feeling of extreme discomfort and self-criticism and self-rejection as i said it could culminate in extreme cases in suicidal ideation and even suicide so peer groups are not unalloyed um, unalloyed public good peer groups are not all good peer groups could have adverse outcomes and even constitute a, a form of childhood adverse, exper adverse experience let me read to you something about William II William II was the Kaiser of Germany at the beginning of the 20th century and his most fervent wish was to be respected and accepted by his peers the other heads of state of Europe he went about it in a very narcissistic and peculiar way and Winston Churchill this sharp observer of human affairs and and uh, the laureate of the Nobel Prize for Literature had this to say about William II just strut around and pose and rattle the undrawn sword all he wished said Churchill about William II was to feel like Napoleon and be like him without having had to fight his battles surely less than this would not pass muster if you are the summit of a volcano the least you can do is smoke <laughs> so he smoked a pillar of cloud by day and the gleam of fire by night to all who gaze from afar and slowly and surely these perturbed observers gathered and joined themselves together for mutual protection but underneath all this posing and its trappings was a very ordinary vain but on the whole well-meaning man hoping to pass himself off as a second frederick the great this quote is lifted off <laughs> henry kissinger's um, magisterial masterpiece diplomacy so this was william ii and clearly peer rejection in his case played a major role in the formation of both his personality and his policies which led inexorably to the first world war one of the reasons is that peer groups are in groups in other words you belong to them by excluding others peer groups thrive on othering and on the failure to perceive other people as equal with ideas hopes dreams wishes emotions cognitions and so on there's a collective negative identity formation he who belongs to the peer group belongs to it by virtue of excluding others and excluding himself from any contact or affiliation with others othering alt alterity is a major feature of peer groups exclusion that is why most peer groups are unisex members of the same sex and unigender members of the same gender peer groups are also founded on hierarchy Dom dominance versus submission peer groups are very stratified and it is precisely this stratification which provides a sense of safety popularity well-being and defiant autonomy why is that because the family is uh, is hierarchical father and mother are at the top or the apex of the pyramid and then there are the children families are hierarchies they're not networks bad parents encourage equality in decision making with their children good parents lead 
peer groups emulate the structure of a good family, which is one of the main attractions of belonging to a peer group, it's a surrogate or substitute family. So in this sense, exactly like mother and even more so father, peers are socialization agents. They convey, they're conveyors and purveyors of social and sexual behavioral script, scripts. They tell you as a member of the peer group how you should behave sexually and socially. And this is guaranteed and ascertained via peer pressure and modeling. Now, peer pressure is one thing, modeling is another. Peer pressure is simply a set of implicit sanctions if you misbehave. If you misbehave, you're punished. If you behave, you're rewarded, you're incentivized to conform to the peer group's values, mores, norms, behavioral scripts, and expectations. And if, again, you stray, you are penalized, sometimes severely, by shunning and excommunication. But another mechanism at work in peer groups is modeling. When lesser or inferior members of the peer group imitate the leaders of the peer group, their betters, and this is role, and these members serve as role models, so they model behavior. This is known as social learning theory. In other words, peer groups serve as what we call social reference, social reference, because they teach their members customs, social norms, gender roles, and a variety of ideologies. If you do not belong to a peer group during your childhood, and especially during adolescence, something is wrong with you, and your personal growth and development are hindered, impeded, and deformed. A lack of affiliation to a peer group alters cognitive linguistic, social, and emotional paths of development. This has been proven in numerous studies. One of the main predictors and indicators of later life dysfunction, dysfunction during adulthood, is isolation and loneliness during childhood and adolescence. I refer you also to the work of Lev Vygotsky, his sociocultural theory, Jean Piaget's theory of cognitive development, Eric Erikson's stages of psychosocial development. I have a video dedicated to, actually, dedicated to Eric Erikson, and Harry Stack Sullivan's theory of interpersonal relations. Sullivan is a much forgotten genius in the field of psychology. Piaget mentioned that children's speech is less egotistical when they are among themselves than when they interact with adults. In other words, the peer group has an inhibiting um, effect on its members. It channels, molds, shapes behavior so that it becomes less antisocial, asocial, and abrasive within the peer group. But what Piaget neglected to mention is that the dynamics within the peer group sometimes render its members antisocial, even psychopathic, narcissistic, abrasive, egotistical, aggressive. Peer group creates a schism, a dual personality. There is the in-group personality, and this is very common in cults, for example. So there is the in-group personality and the outgroup personality, and they are mutually exclusive, irreconcilable. It is as if the group, the peer group, informs its members anything bad, any aggression, any hatred, any frustration, any negative effects should be directed outward to the outgroup, to the to the people excluded from the peer group, and this again feeds into negative identity formation and the emergence of pathological narcissism. Sullivan described friendships within peer groups 
as providing the following functions. Number one, they offer a consensual validation. Number two, they bolster feelings of self-worth. Number three, they provide affection, compassion, and a context for intimate disclosure without fear, also known as a secure base. Number four, friendships or peer belonging promotes, promote interpersonal sensitivity. And finally, they set the foundation for romantic and parental relationships in adulthood. Sullivan therefore regards peer groups as boot camps or practicing grounds where people practice their social skills, sexual skills, and ability to manage relationships. He regards peer groups as indispensable in the formation and the acquisition of the experience needed to cope with other people, get along with them, collaborate with them, and yield common outcomes, for example, children. And of course, in all this, the narcissistic child fails. He fails to belong, he fails to conform, he fails to collaborate, work together, he's a bad, bad team member, and, and he fails to uh, acquire the group's affirmation and support. He, so narcissists usually are outliers and outcasts, or they become bullies within the hierarchy of dominance in the peer group. They never become regular members of the peer group, and therefore they never go through proper socialization. They never acquire behavioral scripts. They, they never become adults. They never practice relationships with other people in the peer group. They are either outside the peer group looking in with envy and hatred and resentment and frustration, or they are within the peer group, humiliating, berating, degrading, demeaning, and aggressing against everyone else in the peer group until the peer group falls apart. Peer groups decrease dependence on parents because peer groups, as I said, substitutes for parents in, to a large degree, not fully, but to a large degree. So peer groups increase the feelings of self-confidence and self-sufficiency, and therefore peer groups are a cornerstone in the regulation of a sense of self-worth and self-esteem. Peer groups are also bridges between the individual and larger social networks. They are the engines of object, of late life object relations. Peer groups were all, are also behavioral, behavioral laboratories. They, in a way, condition the members to behave appropriately and normatively. Of course, according to the to the peer group's norms, not to society's norms. But very often, the norms of the peer group tally with or correspond to the norms of society. That is much more often than we think. Peer groups are rarely rebellious. They are actually conformist and they're pro-social in the vast majority of cases. So peer groups teach you how to behave via processes that could be easily described as conditioning. So there's modeling, there's peer pressure, and there is conditioning. Observations made by John Watson, B.F. Skinner, Albert Bandura, Judith Rich Harris, um, and other behaviorists made clear that within groups, within peer groups more precisely, and in in groups more generally, there is operant learning going on. In other words, conditioned learning. A set of positive and negative reinforcements which induce specific behaviors and incentivize them, induce and incentivize specific behaviors, and on the other hand, penalize and diminish the frequency of other behaviors. And this is operant learning theory. There's also cognitive social learning theory. The peer group operates via cognitions. Some of these cognitions are explicit. 
sentences that are said aloud. And some of these, of these cognitions are implicit and communicated mainly, mainly non-verbally via body language and behavior. So there's a lot of cognitive processing taking place in the peer group. And one could say that a member of the peer group outsources some cognitive processes to the peer group. And that's why we have the emergence of the hive mind or the crowd mind or the mob, the mob mind. When you are in a crowd, in a group, in a mob, you are no longer fully yourself. You acquire the characteristics of the collective and they become yours. You become indistinguishable from other members of the group. And this is done via the outsourcing of cognitive and emotional processes to the ground, to the group, something the narcissist is incapable of doing. And this hampers and hinders the narcissist's ability to belong. According to social identity theory, group norms are developed and enforced through socialization processes. And they promote in-group similarity. This is known as normative regulation. And it is coupled with the practice of social behaviors via assigned roles. Every member in the group, in the, in the peer group, has a role to play, exactly like in the family. Peer groups are extended families. And this role is assigned for the duration of the membership in the peer group and long after. It's lifelong. And so these social behaviors via assigned roles assist in normative regulation because they inhibit behaviors which conflict with the role or undermine the role. Now, some of these roles coalesce some groups, some in-groups or some peer groups acquire an identity of superiority or an identity of victimhood or an identity of superiority via victimhood. These are very common features of peer groups and individuals within the peer group are expected to play a role that is commensurate with the peer group's view of itself and its place in the world. If the peer group is narcissistic, believes itself to be somehow superior, uh, has a fantastic, inflated, grandiose view of itself, each and every one of the members would acquire narciss a narcissistic style, narcissistic behaviors, and narcissistic traits, albeit maybe not full-fledged pathological narcissism. Similarly, if the group's identity relies heavily on its real or alleged imaginary or truthful victimhood, then everyone within the group would be encouraged to act as a victim, to promote victimhood identity, to insist on rights attendant upon victimhood, and to impose obligations on the out-group, on people excluded from the group, obligations that conform to the group's victimhood uh, stance or victimhood mentality. This is a halo effect via affiliation. Affiliating with a peer group substitutes some of the internal processes. And so the peer group provides external regulation. In return, the members of the peer group acquire the characteristics of the peer group, become a mirror of the peer group, become, in, become extensions of the peer group. You can already see that the dynamics of peer groups have a lot to do with the dynamics of pathological narcissism because peer groups promote shared fantasies and regard their members as mere extensions, objectify the members. The cohesion and long longevity of peer groups is determined and maintained by various factors. How good and frequent is the communication among the members in the peer group? Is there a consensus within the group, a normative code 
which is which is common to all members or is there opposition or resistance in a faction within the peer group um, what about group conformity concerning attitudes and behaviors the the higher the level of communication the more frequent the communication is the more coherent the group consensus the more um, strictly imposed the normative code um, the more egregious the sanctions in case of devi devi deviation from the code and the greater the group conformity concerning attitudes and behaviors the longer the group survives as a cohesive functioning unit but some peer groups sanction rebellion they sanction non-conformity they sanction um, div uh, div deviance or div deviation or divergence from the group's norms mores values attitudes and behaviors these sanctions usually constitute a form of rejection now when i say some peer groups do this i would i have to correct myself and indicate that i'm talking about the overwhelming vast majority of peer groups although some peer groups uh, elevate non-sanctioning to a tenet of the group's ideology so for example religious peer groups they don't place a lot of emphasis on sanctioning at least not formally although informally they're very punitive uh, the vast majority of peer groups have explicit punishments penalties and sanctions in place in case you go against the group against the grain against the ideology against the philosophy of the group and so these groups are able to impose behaviors on members that the members would have never contemplated outside the peer group peer groups in other words be modify behaviors then they not only modify values and cognitions and emotions and the sense of self-worth and self-esteem but they also modify behaviors for example some peer groups can drive their members to become more reckless to take more risks to become more aggressive or more promiscuous other peer groups can drive their members to become more pro-social less antagonistic and dissocial it all depends on the ethos and the narrative common to all group members the ethos and the narrative of the peer group because the peer group is an entity separate from its members this is very important to understand we have this notion democratic notion of the, the members make the group that is completely untrue the group has a life of its own it says that it has dynamics of its own it's it's a living breathing entity and it imposes on its members personalities characters and temperaments that very often are alien to the members the members sometimes feel estranged within the group but they are so afraid to lose uh, their affiliation they're so afraid to not belong they're so afraid to be rejected or not accepted that they change their personality to conform to the group's personality so there is a group personality there are group mores there are group values ideologies and philosophies and they are unique only to the group and not reducible to any single member of the group peer groups are therefore emergent social phenomena emergent in the sense that they cannot be reduced to their constituencies and constituents and so the narcissist has difficulty with all this this narcissist don't do belonging narcissists don't do conforming especially psychopathic narcissists narcissists are pro-social on the surface they're takers they're not givers and they're likely to abuse the peer group or leverage it to obtain narcissistic supply and then not give anything in return and so narcissists are exposed within peer groups 
very fast and expelled from peer groups even faster. Ultimately, peer groups serve as membranes, filtering out narcissists. Now, psychopaths are better able to use peer groups and remain integrated within peer groups, even as leaders or charismatic figures. But narcissists usually fail miserably. As narcissists lack social skills. They are blind to social and environmental cues. Their cold empathy serves them to scan for vulnerabilities of groups, of, of members in groups, and then try to leverage or use these vulnerabilities. But otherwise, they are very autistic. Narcissists are very autistic. And so, exactly like people with autism spectrum disorder, narcissists are shunned, excommunicated, rejected, and avoided. And this causes narcissists to become a lot more aggressive because it's very frustrating. Peer groups radicalize narcissists. Peer groups push narcissists to become actually psychopathic, at least behaviorally, not psychodynamically, not psychologically, but behaviorally. Peer groups actually are incubators for malignant narcissism. And with this optimistic note, I will leave you for the rest of the day.